Okay, so in rather academic fashion, I put a title on. Um, from El Dorado to Amazonian Dark Earth, can soil solve global warming? And uh, uh, this is what I do now that I'm retired. Um, it's all serendipitous that it happens. So it's very much, it follows exactly on what the previous speaker was saying. Uh, it just all happened and I'm having the time of my life, I have to tell you. Uh, I work part of the year in Peru where uh, I have created a nonprofit organization which I have named Sachamama Center for Biocultural Regeneration. Sachamama is uh, the name of the local uh, Quechua speaker, indigenous people, for the spirit of the rainforest. Uh, that's why I chose that name. Uh, it's a center that is a laboratory for working on both local and global solution to food sovereignty and climate change. Um, no, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I wanted to push this. Oh, where is that little light? Here we go. Uh, this is the department of San Martin, where my center is located. Here's the city of Tarapoto, where the airport is. And uh, I'm in a little town, very small town called Lamas, colonial town, half hour up the hill from Tarapoto, which itself is an hour from Lima by plane to the northeast. Um, Half of Peru, the white part, is lowland Amazon. That is, it's very flat. Uh, we are located in this uh, part of the Andes, the foothills, the eastern tropical foothills of the Andes, where the rain clouds coming from the Atlantic on the east drop all their water. And on the western slope, there is very little water, and the western coast is actually a desert. Um, yes, I think that's about what I wanted to say about where I am. Oops. Uh, yes, it's a bit of a squeezed picture. It's a pan panoramic picture of my center, rather the rest and recreation part of my center. We have working parts, and you'll see some of it. And it's a very typical high Amazon type of uh, landscape, very lush. It rains a lot, uh, a lot of sun, and sloped. We are on a ridge, and uh, you can see down in the valley here, you have a view of the lights of the city in the evening. This is an evening slide. Um, and by the way, yes, I forgot to tell you, I'm very proud. This pool, we designed it and researched it on the internet, it's the first, as far as I know, pool in Peru that is natural. It's chlorine-free, and you have around it aquatic plants, including papyri here, uh, that cleans the water as well as oxygenation and something else. So uh, I hate chlorine, so I didn't want to swim in chlorine. <laughs> well, here, in this slide, this is a slide from archaeologists. Um, Actually, before I tell you about uh, the slide, I need to tell you a little bit more about uh, what I do there. Um, I've been spending uh, the last 18 years visiting every year this uh, area. Uh, and I've been working with the local, mostly the local indigenous people, but I've also come to know the mestizo people who are descended from both uh, Spaniard and uh, indigenous uh, parentage, but who speak Spanish and identify with European culture, whereas the indigenous people speak Quechua and are the descendant of the original inhabitants. Um, there, in, uh, through uh, reading uh, some uh, scholarly books, um, I found a solution to what I noticed right away when I came. What I noticed was a tremendous amount of deforestation. And every year I go, there's less forest. And that situation uh, has created and is creating more and more 
a situation of uh, uh, an urgent situation for food security for the small farmers, who are the majority of the people, as well as it's very bad for uh, climate change. It contributes to, um, to global warming, and I will explain how. So through my readings, I came upon a, an amazing piece of information uh, that told me about a type of soil, a pre-Columbian soil, that archaeologists had been rediscovering in the past few decades. And the scholars call that soil Amazonian dark earth. Now, the, the word El Dorado in the title of my talk refers to a myth or a legend that the conquistador, uh, the invaders, the Spanish invaders that came to the Americas in the 16th century believed in. They believed there was a golden city somewhere east in the Amazon. And they were after gold. That's what they came there mostly for. And the first expedition by a conquistador down the Amazon was led by Francisco de Orellana in 1542. And he came down the Amazon. And his friar on the boat, named Carvajal, wrote everything that he saw. And what he wrote is that he saw beautiful, gleaming white cities along the Amazon for miles, beautiful temples, a populous, uh, sophisticated uh, population. Um, but what happened is that the next time there was a, an expedition, a few decades later, they went by Europeans. They went down the Amazon, and they saw only forest. They saw nothing. So ever since then, uh, it was decided that Carvajal had imagined it all, had lied uh, to make himself famous. And this is what I was taught in graduate school uh, in the 70s. Uh, because that uh, established knowledge is only very recent being completely put on its head by the recent uh, archaeological uh, discoveries. Um, fortunately, uh, this soil has been studied extensively by many scientists, and in particular soil scientists. So by reading their report, I was able to know how to do it, know its variants, know the crucial ingredients. And I'm going to simplify the story uh, because making this soil is pretty, uh, well, it's not complicated, but it's complex. Uh, and I'm focusing on one ingredient because that ingredient affects powerfully global warming. So that's the story I will be telling you. And uh, we involve US uh, students, both high school uh, seniors as well as college undergraduate, in our projects there at Sachamama through two study abroad courses, one in the winter, one in the summer. And if uh, you want to know more about it, you can uh, look at our website. It comes up in Spanish, click on the US flag, and then it comes up in English. So now we come to the first slide taken from an archaeological uh, publication. And in that slide, you see uh, digging down in the earth. Uh, it's over a meter deep. The bottom layer is, uh, well, the color is actually not very realistic, but it's yellowish, orangish. And that's the original Amazonian soils. Amazonian soils are extremely poor. They have very little nutrients. They are not very fertile at all. Most of the nutrients are in the canopy of the rainforest, but not in the soil. But above uh, the original layer, there is a black layer. And that black, black layer in Brazil is called Terra Preta do Indio, which means Black Earth of the Indians. It's what scholars call Amazonian Dark Earth. And it's anthropogenic or human-made by the pre-Columbian people. They have dated those sites, the archaeologists, and uh, the results are amazing. The oldest site are 8,000 years old. And the most amazing thing is that that soil is still fertile today. Uh, it is 
totally amazing. Now, what has happened since the, uh, with the Spanish invasion in the 16th century is that nine of 10 of the indigenous people died. There was an absolute demographic collapse, mostly due to a lack of immunity uh, on the part of Amerindian to European diseases. And therefore, this technology was forgotten. And what happened is that the Spaniards brought with them uh, steel axes and other steel tools. And these steel axes uh, enabled the survivors uh, to quickly uh, make a clearing in the forest and uh, cut down the tree at waist high, burn uh, the wood, and that gave, gives phosphate to the poor soil, and that allows you to grow crops from between a year to four year max. Then you can't grow anything, and you allow the forest to regenerate. If you do this, try to do this, and, and this has been done by scientists with a stone axis, it will uh, take you over five months. With a steel axe, it takes a few days. So that's how the current form of agriculture, which is called slash and burn, or Sweden agriculture, uh, began. Now, the black color in the terra preta slide that I showed you is biochar. Now, what is biochar? Biochar is a type of charcoal that is produced, when it's produced responsibly, I should add, from biomass such as agricultural residues. You know, you harvest your corn, you've got lots of corn stalks. Uh, locally, what we've got mountains of down in the valley are rice husks that they actually burn, which is very bad for the atmosphere. Um, or, or forest residues, or lawn residues, and you carbonize them without oxygen, and that process is called pyrolysis. Biochar is put in the soil, and it has the following totally amazing characteristic. Biochar greatly increases the retention of nutrients in soil, and in the Amazon region, it's key, especially in the high Amazon where the, the, the slopes, the the fields are on slopes. Uh, the rains are torrential, and they, put, they take everything away. With biochar, the nutrients stick to the biochar for millennia. Biochar greatly increases crop yield without the use of agrochemicals. And a very well-known soil scientist actually measured in, on Amazonian soil the difference, and the difference when you don't put Terra preta on Amazonian soil versus terra preta soil. Terra preta soil is 880% more fertile. So it's staggering. The process of making biochar itself takes out CO2 from the atmosphere. Biochar captures and stores CO2 in the soil forever, for millennia. Uh, and the process of making biochar, uh, you can capture the heat that is produced and transform it into energy, and that is renewable and, most importantly, clean energy. So it's quite an amazing thing. Here is the backyard biochar oven we built at Sachamama. It is made totally from recycled. Here uh, we have actually three, two only show in this slide oil drums, uh, and uh, the doors are made from flattened old oil drums. Uh, and then the hearth for the initial fire is made from some car part from, of the wheel. And then the tubes uh, that capture uh, the gases that uh, come out of the uh, uh, drum um, are also recycled. Now, we fill those drums. Uh, what we use are coconut husks or rice husks that are plentiful. Then we close uh, this, and you see those three bolts tightly so that oxygen doesn't come in. You light the fire, and we use a woody fruit. To, we don't use any wood. And then you close the door to keep uh, the heat in. And when it reaches a certain temperature, 
the gases uh, then are redirected under the drum with holes, just like in an oven, and uh, they light up and finish the carbonization. So we could uh, capture the heat and transform it into electricity, but that's too expensive for our resources and too fancy, so we're not doing that. But I'm hoping in the future, perhaps with some grants, we could do that. Uh, now, this is what slash and burn or Sweden agriculture looks like when you have just uh, cleared a field. Uh, so you clear a field of an acre or two acres, and you cut, you don't uproot the trees, and um, that's what everybody does in the whole Amazon basin, lowlands and highlands as well. Uh, it only yields, as I said, maximum four years, usually one or two years only. Then you let the forest regenerate. Um, unfortunately, the, this is no longer sustainable. To be sustainable, you have to own at least 100 acres. And the mean uh, land ownership of indigenous people and poor mestizo people is max six acres. So uh, it is not sustainable, and uh, it has led to an increased amount of degraded land. And experts say that slash and burn agriculture in the whole Amazon basin is the third cause of the emission of carbon dioxide in the Amazon region. So for various reasons, it is, it, it, it's urgent. And the leadership of the indigenous people have come to such a mama center and uh, have asked us to work with them to give them an alternative because they say our children can't continue we barely can make it now there's too much degraded land in this slide uh, whoops sorry uh, this slide here is a degraded land and um, uh, that is growing uh, and what we are doing with uh, native communities is that on this degraded land, we create permanent gardens and we put this terra preta full of biochar on it. And um, such fields, uh, both are very fertile, have given tremendous harvest to the communities. And it also withdraws CO2 four ways by leaving the trees standing trees capture CO2 by not burning them, which sends a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, by making biochar that withdraws CO2, and then lastly putting it in the soil. So it's a very powerful method. Here is one of the native communities we work with and their permanent terra preta garden, which we, uh, they built and we work with them together. They've had now about, sorry, about four harvests, plentiful harvest, and they're quite happy with this. And the local school uh, has a little, one room school has its own little terra preta garden, so the kids can learn it. Now in this slide, I've put side by side the terra preta garden in such a mama center, which is what we started with. We had a piece of sand and rock where nothing grew. And we made terraces so that the terra preta doesn't get washed out. And we are growing our vegetables and our beans and fruits there. And it's wonderful. And it looks great. And I am contrasting it here with a description of the problems of industrial agriculture, which in US is the majority of agriculture, as in the EU and in most uh, wealthy countries. Industrial food production relies on non-renewable non fossil energy, both in its machinery and in the chemicals used to grow the food. Soil and water have been depleted faster than predicted. These are the latest uh, reports. Chemical fertilizers, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, are becoming less efficient. Uh, agrochemicals used in that type of agriculture accelerate the loss of soil organic carbon. 
and that leads to decreased yields and especially to global warming. It's no longer, the soil is no longer a sink for uh, CO2. So putting biochar in the soil is a simple and effective uh, solution. Now, if we take stock now of climate change, well, as you know, uh, the latest UN framework convention of climate change in Qatar was supposed to end yesterday. I heard on the radio this morning it spilled over till this morning. I don't know what the latest agreements were, but it's very difficult to sign agreements on reduction of emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Global carbon dioxide emissions are at a record high. They jumped 3% last year. Over 25% of CO2 emissions since 1960 happen in the US, even though the US has only 5% of the global population. And it's true, though, uh, the good news is that in the last few, very few years, uh, the wealthy nation, US and the EU in particular, have reduced their emission by a few percentage points, while countries such as China and India, have their emissions have soared. But still, the historical responsibility is with the uh, wealthy nations. The level, now the situation is that the levels of parts per million ppm of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere um, has exceeded the safe level, which experts put at 350 ppm, and it's now at about 374 ppm. And it's climbing faster than people predicted. Now, uh, one way of dealing with uh, the difficulty of signing accords is making a difference between re reducing emissions and withdrawing or sequestering uh, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Wealthy countries bear responsibility for the majority of accumulated emissions in the past. Wealthy nations resist agreements to lower emissions unless developing nations sign on. That's why it's so difficult to agree on such things. Uh, a way forward out of this deadlock is for wealthier nations to withdraw or sequester CO2 from the atmosphere independently of any emission reduction accords. An effective and successful way of sequestering CO2 emissions from the atmosphere is biochar. Uh, additionally, the solution has great agricultural benefits, as well as being a source of clean and renewable energy. And furthermore, in that way, wealthy nations can thus pay their, their past uh, emissions debt while improving food and energy production. Now, it's interesting that the leading lights on um, the global warming crisis, such as Bill McKibben, Al Gore, and Jim Henson, uh, are not talking about biochar. It's not on the horizon. I think that is because it's uh, known, it was discovered in Amazonia, and it's made its primary impact with soil scientists and about food and it, its potential for addressing uh, global warming is slowly uh, filtering to a broader audience, and I think they, it will make it on the horizon soon enough. The leading light who has been pushing biochar is a soil scientist at Cornell University, Professor Johannes Lehmann, who has worked in Manaus in Brazil for many years and then moved to Cornell, and he created the International Biochar Institute. So he's the one who's really pushing it. So in conclusion, I would say, I would call this, as a book I've been reading calls it, the biochar revolution for local and global solutions, which is what we do at Sachamama. Biochar in soil greatly increases food yield. And it does that organically, right, without agrochemicals. Making biochar itself 
sequesters CO2 and can produce, if the heat is captured, uh, clean and renewable energy. And you can do it at industrial uh, uh, levels, and it's being done. It's, there are several places in the US that produce biochar industrially. Biochar is an abundant and renewable resources uh, in uh, agricultural uh, residues and other res uh, biomass residues. Putting biochar in the soil withdraws CO2 from the atmosphere for millennia. So it's better than uh, reducing emissions. I mean, we have to reduce emissions. But meanwhile, we certainly should withdraw what we have emitted. And biochar greatly improves soil fertility. Uh, biochar, being an effective carbon sink, can recapture past emissions. So for me, it spells uh, solving a local problem of food security and also a local problem as well as a global problem uh, about uh, global warming. So I have put everything that is at my disposal to work for this project. And I would love for all of you to come and visit me at Sachanama. Thank you.